Mr. David Rocha, pastor of House of Rest in Modesto. What's up? How you doing, brother? I'm good, man. I'm good, man. I I love the fish. Yeah, they're relaxing. Is that the tank that broke or? No, no. The one that broke was a 65 gallon and I upgraded to a 75 gallon. Right on, man. Right on. All right. Yeah, once those things break, I don't I don't want I didn't want to reseal it. I don't trust it anymore. Yeah, you know my little tank that I got going on? Yeah. Uh, under it, I got all my underneath that tank. It's on it's like on the top of some shelf. I yeah. got all my books that I've been saving since I've been a Christian. I mean all those theological books and everything. So if that thing breaks, it's taking out my book. So I'm just waiting for my fish to pass away, man, so I can get rid of that thing. And, <laughs> you know, hopefully get a piranha tank later. A you piranha know? tank? Yeah, man. We had one when we were younger. Um, so I had I had a couple. Well, we had a couple. Me and my friends, we had a we had a hangout house, and we had a uh, five piranhas. And one side of the tank was this. Uh, what do you call those? The crawdad. Something like yeah. that crayfish, something like that. The other side of the tank was a a, a, a turtle we named Gamera, and man, it, it used to be a trip. Man, everybody had their spaces, and then uh, it was a trip. So red bellied piranhas, so they're cool, but they're yeah. wimps. They're wimps, so, man. So they each stayed on their own part of the tank. Pretty much, pretty much. But Gamera, Gamera the turtle, man, he would go wherever he wanted to, man. But then um, three of the fish died, and then we had two and. Once, once those other fish died, the, the piranhas just became like wimps. You wow. Know, just, uh, you know, they're not really vicious. You know, when they smell blood, they get hungry and excited. Yeah, yeah, man. So a couple of people saying what's up before we get into the subject. Oh, uh, okay. Ari Marin, what's happening? All right. Staying tuned while I do this job, huh? Thank you for this. Saludos, Pastor. All right. Amen. Pastor David, House of Party. Yeah, cool. Brother David. <laughs> <laughs> Stand yeah. firm. Yeah, that's right, man. That's Lender, right. Yeah. Okay. Got one more. What's up, Pastor David? I send mine to you and your family. May God continue to bless bless you guys and watch over you guys always. Yay, yay. Amen. Thank you. Yeah, I, I, on, on my end, I can't see the chat because I'm on my phone. Oh, no worries, man. I'll, I'll read so, them to you. I'll yeah, and then at the end we'll we'll go through them really quick. Uh, okay. But the reason I wanted to have you on, and I was telling you, um, people, and I don't know that you know everyone who watches if they're involved in a church or, you know, a lot of people you know we believe in Jesus, you know, but he ain't Lord to a lot of people, and I wanted to get you on to talk about how. God still moves. He moved in the Bible, obviously, yeah. through the apostles and, you know, the evangelists, everybody. And I wanted to show people how God moves today, you know, that God could still move. And there was a verse I was thinking, it's in the middle of the verse, talking about, as I was on the way, the Lord led me. There's so many times that, like, God may ask us to do something. And, and as we step out into the water, step out in faith, he'll use us and he'll direct us. And I kind of wanted you to share, man, if you can, um, man, about your trip and also if God still moves through people and, you know, like what you've seen during this trip or whatever else you want to share in regards to that, man. So yeah. uh, that's what I really wanted to get into, to show people that God could still use your life and will use your life if you let him. So take it away, bro. Yeah, well, I mean, in case people are wondering what trip, I, uh, my wife and I just went to Texas. And um, uh, a chaplain, he belongs to a group of chaplains. I think they have 100 chaplains all together. They service, I think, 12 to 15 prisons in Texas. And um, one of them is from Northern California in the past. So he knew who I was as a, as a recording artist. So he's, he's a Christian now. He's a chaplain. He goes in and speaks at one of the prisons there. It's called Beto, Beto Unit. And I didn't realize till after I left that it's a maximum security prison there. And um, he wanted me to come in because every single Wednesday um, he goes into the prison there and he wanted me to go in and just kind of share with the men. So um, 
I never wanted to go back, bro. I wasn't the type that got out of prison and said, oh, I can't wait to go back and minister to the men. Um, I never wanted to go back, to be honest with you. And and uh, when I stepped out, um, I was released from the BOP 2000, January, January, I forgot what date, 2010. And I never wanted to step back in there. But when he asked me, um, I didn't hesitate. I just said, yeah. And I didn't know what I was expecting. Oh, okay. Thanks. Oh, my son brought me my tablet showing me that I can read the, <laughs> the, the, uh, the comments, but, um, but yeah, man, uh, I stepped in, you know, I didn't know how I was going to feel, man. I, I, um, Wait, David, I didn't before, know. before you get there, like, yeah. so you're at home, you get this call to go. How do you know to go? How did you know you had to go? And was that the sole purpose or did, when you decided to go, was there other doors that opened up? I just want to see the process of how God spoke to you to get out of here and go do my work. Well, um, House of Rest it has a covering called Grace International. Grace International is an international. We have over 4,000 churches. And uh, most the reason I like Grace International is because um, there's more churches internationally than there is in the United States. And I like that because, un unfortunately, a lot of American Christianity has been very watered down and very diluted. And when I heard that this group of pastors has a majority outside of the United States, I thought that's a better, well-rounded, more balanced view of Christianity. So that's why I liked it. But anyways, they always have their leadership conference in Oceanside, you know, down towards San Diego. But this year they had it at the headquarters in Houston. So um, that's when I flew down there. My wife and I went over there enjoyed the, the the leadership conference and on my way out as i was at the airport in houston about to fly home i get a, a, a an email and it's this chaplain saying hey you know i don't know if you'll answer me uh, i used to listen to your music um but please if you were ever willing to come to texas and i thought it was the funniest thing the fact that i was in texas i thought maybe maybe he follows me on facebook or youtube maybe he knew i was in texas he didn't know you know, so that was the first sign for me. The fact that I'm in Texas, leaving Texas, and this guy is asking me to come to Texas. So I, I messaged back and I said, hey, I'm about to enter a plane. I, I can't call you right now, but shoot me your number as soon as I get home. And um, when I heard the sincerity of his voice and, and what he was doing, you know, this guy came out of drug addiction. He came out of gang banging. Um, Never prison, but I think some jail time, but he was just out there, man. And when I heard his life and the fact that he now goes into the prison every single week and the passion I heard in his voice for these men, 200 men that he ministers to, um, I had to say yes. You know, I feel that, um, see, people have asked me, hey, man, you should go into the prisons. And I've always said, um, I don't, I'm not called for that. But when somebody called saying, here's an open door, I want you to come. Because the first thing I told him, I said, you know, I'm a felon, right? I said, I don't know how I'm going to get in. And he goes, don't worry about it. He goes, if you say yes, I'll get you in. I took that as a sign from God saying, okay, David, you, you for whatever reason, you had your hesitations of going back. But I'm opening the door now. And I'll give you one verse that came to my mind. Um, uh, Peter... Jesus talked to Peter at the end, right after the resurrection, and he tells Peter, he says, when you were a young man, you went where you wanted to go. But when you're going to be an old man, you're going to go where you don't want to go. And, um, and that verse popped in my head, and that was the second part for me of saying yes, because I realized that if I have truly gave myself to the Lord, then I'm going to enter every open door that he opens, whether I like it or not. You know, and that's kind of, that's not kind of, that is why I said yes. And um, if there's a way he, this this man could open the door for me to step into a prison, being a three-time felon, then I was going to do it. You know, and I'm so glad I did. That is so awesome, man. Yeah, continue, man. Let's 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 take it. So you're in Texas, you land, man, and then uh, tell us about the ministry that God did through you guys, man. Yeah, well, you know... <laughs> He, he kept saying, he, he kept saying, Pastor, he goes, uh, um, 
is it okay if, if you stay at our house? You know, it's going to be of like, bro, I, I, don't, I don't, I'm not like that. I don't trip off that stuff. You know, all I'm saying is you give me a plane ticket and one for my wife because I don't want to be alone. I, I hate being without her, bro. So I said, if you can take me and my wife, a flies over there, we'll sleep on the couch, we'll sleep wherever. And he's like, no, you don't got to do that. I got an extra room, you know? So I said, well, let's do it. You know, let's do it. And um, so then as, as they got closer, he said, well, there's a, um, we do a grocery giveaway feeding on Thursdays. Would you like to join that? I said, yes. And then later he goes, well, there's a men's um, rehab that I talked to on Thursday evening. Can we do that? I said, yes. You know, and then he goes, well, you know, as the days progress, he goes, well, since your wife is coming, he goes, is there any way you can both minister? Because I, I, I go to a women's rehab. I said, yes. You know, and then he's like, well, since you're going to be here, is there any way on Friday we could go to Beaumont prison and you talk to 400 men? And I'm like, yes. You know what I mean? I'm like, let's do it. I said, I don't want to, I don't want to fly. You guys are paying our ticket and I don't take that lightly. Because them plane tickets ain't cheap, you know. And maybe they're cheap to some people, but for some of us, that's a lot of money. And and for me, I'm just like, that's God's money. That's money that these people have, you know, to further the gospel. So I don't want to sit there and take advantage. I said, brother, I said, I'll be as busy as you need us to be, you know. And, um, and unfortunately, Beaumont got locked down, so I didn't get to go to that prison. But I got to speak at a prison. I had a meeting with a pastor. I went to the rehab for men, rehab for women. We went to the grocery feeding. It was just a great, great time, you know. Man, what? So you didn't you didn't demand a limo? You didn't <laughs> demand a four star, five star hotel? You no. know, heard stuff like that, bro. Yeah, I mean, that's a blessing, bro. That's a blessing. And uh, can you tell us, like, like specifically, like some of the stuff, some of the miracles or people you prayed over, or? Yeah, stuff? actually, I'm glad you asked that. Um, because I want to show them, man, that God still uses our lives, you know, and God could use their lives. Well, you know, um, I teach identity in Christ. Uh, identity in Christ is knowing who you are. And I'll say like this in summary, is that I believe every church does a great job at teaching who God is, who Jesus is. Every church, whether it's Catholic, Pentecostal, all of them exalt God as God should be. But unfortunately, what doesn't happen is we don't get taught who we are in Christ. So a lot of times people people come to be a Christian and they, they feel they fall in love with the Lord. They feel like he's right next to them. But the more Sunday sermons they go to, the more they hear how holy God is, holy God is, holy God is, and how horrible you are, horrible. So after a while, you feel so distant from God. And identity teaching is this, is that God is up here. But the Bible says that you are in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. So he is in you. So because of that, I'll tell you why that is a big deal. Because if, if, if I'm led to believe that I'm this filth and God is way up there, then I will never have the self-esteem or the confidence to pray for the sick, cast out demons, to preach with conviction. You know, people, a lot of times people say, man, you preach. I like to listen to you preach. You preach like you actually believe what you're saying. And I said, of course, because I do believe what I'm saying. You know, and, and that's what I mean, because we learn to be in Christ. And we got to, the Bible says that Jesus spoke with authority. That doesn't mean yelling and screaming. Yeah. There's just an authority. When Have you ever talked, bro, have you ever talked to, to uh, let's say, okay, talking about fish. I don't really like going to PetSmart. Because when I ask about fish, or I'm like, hey, can you tell me about this fish? You could tell they don't know what they're talking about. Mm -hmm. But when you go to a fish store, they'll, and you ask about that, they'll be like, what size is your tank? What kind of this? What kind of that? What do you feed them? What? They speak with confidence. They speak with authority. Same thing yeah. with a mechanic. Same thing, you know. So when I go to a mechanic, and, and I, I remember going to this mechanic. He doesn't even have a shop. He's in Tracy. And I pulled up. And when I pulled up, he goes, I know what's wrong with your car. <laughs> because he knew, he knows motors so much, he can hear it when I pulled up. That's confidence, that's authority. And that's what I mean is that as, as men of God, as women of God, before we preach to people, we better ingrain this stuff in us first. Yeah. You know, and um, so anyways, 
So I'm speaking to these 200 men. And the first thing the chaplain told me is this. He goes, hey, um, you can say whatever you want. You can preach to them. You can share your testimony, whatever. And I said, well, I want to, I want to, I want to teach them identity, but, and he says this, and this is what I was thinking. He says, bro, he goes, they're going to receive it more if they know that you're an ex-con. He goes, if they know that you know what it's like in their situation, their ears will open more to receive. I said, all right. So maybe the first 15 minutes I shared about my life. I shared about being in solitary. I, I shared about uh, being locked up for six years, being in the feds, FBI, DEA, all of that stuff. I shared all of that, and then I went into who they are in Christ. I, wa I wanted to encourage them. I knew I had a very small window to speak into their life, and I'm just like, what would I want to hear? Mm -hmm. If I was going to hear a speaker, and this was possibly the only time I would ever hear him, what would I want to hear? You know, and, and at the end, bro, at the end, um, I knew they, they were limited in time. Limited in times. So I said, listen, I can't pray for all of you individually. I said, but I'm going to confirm and the Lord is going to confirm that everything I said is true because God's about to heal you. I said, put your hand. If anybody here has pain, you have something wrong. You have a sickness, you have a disease. Put your hand where that pain is. And God is going to heal you right now. It's going to confirm that what I am saying is true. And it was crazy, right? So I prayed. And and then um, it, they had a count time or whatever. I don't know what they had. A, I saw the inmates leaving. So a couple of them made a beeline to me real quick. They wanted to shake my hand. And one dude, all blasted, just inked up, white dude, bald, comes up to me. And he goes, hey, he goes, a, a friend invited me here today. He Because they said they were going to have a guest speaker. I'll be honest with you. I don't believe in God. He goes, but... He was at the end. He was, my back has been hurting for three weeks and nothing. I don't know. Nothing gives me relief. He was in. When you pray, that pain left instantly. And then he goes, I'm going to have to go back to my cell and rethink some things. You know, and this is what I'm talking about, man, is God still moves. He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. You know, he doesn't have limits. He's limitless. He He does the impossible. And, and real quick, somebody might say, well, then why did so-and-so die? Why did this person die? And, and I would say this, um, many people die in the hospital, but the moment you're sick or the moment something happens, you have no hesitation on having an ambulance taken to the hospital, even though people probably died in that hospital that very day. Mm -hmm. And if you have that much faith in the hospital, yet think, well, how can God heal? So-and-so died, so-and-so died, so-and-so died. Yeah, but how many have lived? How many have been healed? How many have recovered? How many have been restored? You know, and it's not even just about healing. People say, well, that dude who used to be in church, and look at that, he's still Tecato. Yeah, but I could point you a whole bunch of people that used to be Tecatos that are no longer um, uh, addicted now. You know, and I did that yesterday in yesterday's service. Um because there was some new people there. Matter of fact, there was a homeless man that came in and um, God bless his heart because he goes, is it okay? Can I come in because I'm homeless and look at my shirt? His shirt was kind of dirty. And I love, before I even spoke, another member of the church says, bro, you're welcome. You know? And, um, and I love the fact because that means, that means I'm teaching right, you know? And he came in and I didn't want him to, to feel less than, so I purposely did this for him, and he didn't know this. I said, who here has ever been homeless? I had about 90 people in the service. Man, you should have seen how many hands went up. I said, how many people ha were alcoholics? And a whole bunch of hands went up. How many people here were addicted to drugs? A whole bunch of hands went up. How many women here um, got pregnant out of wedlock and raised children as a single mother? Whole bunch of, I mean, I just went down the list. Because I did that for this man, because I didn't want him to feel inadequate. I wanted him to know that he was in a place with a whole bunch of people that were broken, that were shattered, that were lost. There is nobody holier than thou. We, we are a bunch of imperfect people serving a perfect God. Yeah, that is so cool, bro. I, I dig it, man. And I, I'm picturing all this as you're walking. And I love, I mean, as you're talking, and I love the illustrations. And it's really cool. Like, I, I get what you're saying, because... You got this little this little amount of time, you know. I know going back to the jail with these inmates, yeah. right? You got this little amount of time, and I think most people, most preachers would go in 
and say, you know, I got to pre preach the best evangelistic message of my life. And I got to get them saved. And that's cool. And that's needed too. But I think you said, hey, you, you said, hey, I need to show them who they are in Christ. I yeah. need to build them up and help them grow. Because I think you knew a million people are going to come before and after are going to preach that message, you know, of salvation. Yeah. It's needed too, bro. I'm sure you did that too. But to show them who they are in Christ is so important, bro. It's like the book of Ephesians. Those first three chapters showing you yeah. who you are in Christ. And then the next three showing you like the warfare and how to walk in it, man. I, I love yeah. it, man. So it's so cool, bro. It's so cool. Yeah. It, it, it was great, man. It was really good. And uh, um, they want to invite me back now. So they want they want me to go toward the end of the year. Uh, they're asking me if I have any dates available in November or something like that. And it all depends, you know, because at the same time, I mean, I'm a pastor of a church. I have a huge flock here and I, I don't ever want to put them to the side or, or make them second because these are the people God has put around me. You know what I mean? So, but um, it is on a Wednesday. Uh so, I mean, I'm sure there's going to be room. You know, I would love to go back. And uh, here's a, here's a, another amazing thing is the fact that they had a beautiful chapel, man. That chapel was completely covered in murals of the whole Bible from Genesis to Revelation. And you know, you know how inmates get down because we got the time. They were paintings that should have been at a museum, bro. They were beautiful. And um, the only thing that was ugly in that place was a projector. It looked like it was from 1985. And it the it projected, because they project um, scriptures or song lyrics, um, and um, the, the letters were blurry. And I talked to the chaplain, and I said, how can I get you guys a new projector? And and um, he goes, just all you got to do is send it. And then I was talking to to the chaplain, the one that invited me. And he said, bro, he goes, see this concrete floor? I said, yeah. He goes, there used to be carpet here. And I said, so what happened? He goes, some preacher came in and told them that he was going to get them a new carpet. He was and the inmates got so excited. The next day they ripped all the carpet out and that pastor has never been back since. Man. You know, and I said, wow. I said, well, here's the thing is I know how important this stuff is. I said, because I come from this. I said, if I say we're going to get a projector, then we're going to get a projector. And I talked to the main trustee. He's an inmate. And I told him, I said, hey, um, I'm going to get you guys a new projector. I said, what else do you need? I said, I want to know what kind of cord, you know, because it was an old one. He goes, oh, it was a, uh, uh, what are the old, um, VGA, you know, it was a VGA. And I said, I got, we just got a projector at the church. We got blessed with it. And, um. It was a $900 projector. Ours went out, and um, somebody that um, is at the church, he, he wanted to stay anonymous. He he paid the whole thing, you know? And I, I told him, this is what I told them. I said, listen, there's no way that we're going to have a beautiful projector at House of Rest and you guys not have a beautiful projector here because whether this is inside a prison or out, this is still the house of God. Yes. And the house of God should be made with excellence. You know, so I went back to service last Sunday was my first time preaching back and we raised the funds, bro. You know, so this is what I told them at the prison. I said, I, I guarantee you that by the end of August, you'll have a new projector. But you know what? They got the projector Saturday. Wow, that's cool, man. You know, and these are the things that and I, this is what I told the church. I said, it's easy to give to somebody that's going to give back to you. But there's an extra blessing when you give, when you know you can't get nothing back. Because these men, they ain't got nothing. What are they going to give back? But you know how much that's going to bless them? And that's what it's about. You know what I mean? Jesus says, he says, um, when I was in prison, you never visited me. When I was naked, you never clothed me. When I was hungry, you never fed me. And the people said, when were you in prison? When were you hungry? He says, when the least of those, when you do it to them, you do it unto me. You know, and and I just felt like, you know, um, us giving the projector to this place, there's a blessing. You know, what I mean, there's a blessing. There's something beautiful. And we do things um, for those that that are incarcerated, man. And some people might say, well, who cares? They're incarcerated. They're a bunch of criminals. And here's what I always say. 
I always say this. I always say someday, each of those men, there, I think I met two guys there that were lifers. The rest have a release date. Yeah. So either they're going to come out worse or they're going to come out in Christ because they're going to come out to your neighborhood, to your city. To So which one do you want? You know, the best place to reach these men is when they hit rock bottom in prison. Yeah. You know, th there's a reason why people run to the Lord in prison is because they hit rock bottom. And that's another thing I don't like when people say is like, oh, you found Jesus because you were in prison. And I'd be like saying, well, that'd be like saying, oh, you go to a doctor because you're sick. Of course, of course, you go to the hospital or doctor when you're sick. Well, you know what? Many people are sick in their heart, sick in their mind. And when they hit rock bottom, they come to the Lord. That's the best time to come, you know. And unfortunately, we we always make God the last thing, you know. And uh, but but praise God that God is still there. He will turn all evil into something good. Yeah, didn't Jesus say that, man? Those who are uh, those who are sick, they need. But those who are not sick are no need of a doctor. In other words, you guys don't even know you're sick, man. You exactly. Don't know, you don't even know you have sin, bro. So. I wanted to ask you a question as we're kind of breaking it down close. You know, I don't want to keep you too long because I know you're busy, but man, um, like whenever I ask you to come on the show or anything, I know that you're a pastor. You got a flock to look over. You got a wife and a family to look over. You write books, you make movies, you're doing YouTube, you're doing podcasts. Dude, man, dude, um, I guess what I'm asking is, man, why do you make time like to come on besides us being friends like on my channel trouble truckers channel like what's your passion why do you come on and uh what's your purpose in life man you know you you got so much going on to be jumping on my channel and trolls channel and different ones yeah you know however you want to answer that man um i think is is there's there's an urgency in me because every day people are being lost there's an urgency for me to reach people as much as I possibly can. There's an urgency that so many people, um, they think of Christianity or they think of pastors or a church and they think like, oh man, there are a bunch of people that are going to judge me. They're going to, and I don't, I, I want to break those walls down. I want to let people know that watches your channel or Cholo Trucker's channel or, or, you know, if I talk to Gunner or, Whoever it is, American Cholo, Tony A, I want to use every one of those opportunities to destroy stereotypes and let people know. Because if the only thing stopping you from reaching out to God are the stereotypical um, uh, Christian, what you know, conservative, whatever, I want to dismantle that and break that. You know, I realize, I realize, bro, I realized something is that when I got out of prison, I did not want, I thought people forgot who Sir Dino was. Mm -hmm. I really did. Because, you know, rap, man, rap, you're, you're, you're it one minute, the next minute, they're on to the next artist. So for a six year span, I thought for sure people forgot who I am. I'm just going to get out, you know, build relationships with my children again, just go to church and just be an average Joe. Just, uh, you know, I, I didn't, and then I come out and I realize that. Pastor Ed Morales, the one that did Duke of Earl, he wanted me to share my testimony at his church. His church sat 800 people, you know, and I, I declined at first. And then other churches, and finally, um, I kind of had it out with God. I'm like, God, I don't want to relive that stuff. I just want to serve you. I just want to preach. But everybody's opening the door for me to share my life. And, and I felt like the Lord rebuked me. You know, and he says, how are you not going to use that tool that you have? I have put you, I have put you in a position, a strategic position to reach people like you. This is your calling. This is your job. This is what I'm calling you to do. Do not be ashamed of your testimony, you know? And so I went back to Pastor Ed and I did it, you know, and um, he sat 800 people. I believe a thousand people showed up to hear my story. And at the altar call at the end, they said, who would like to receive Christ? I want to, without exaggerating, about 200 people came up, you know, and it just continued like that everywhere I went. And and for a long time, I didn't want to own that, bro. I didn't want to own it. But I realize now when I go on Tony A and get thousands and thousands of views of people that are not Christian, 
or American Cholo, or I did 23 and one, I think it's at 200,000 views. I realized that God has put me in a strategic position and I don't want to be Jonah. See, Jonah is in the Bible. He was swallowed by a big fish because God told him that city is wicked. I'm calling you to go and preach to that city. And Jonah didn't want to do it. So he went on a boat and went the opposite way. And that's where he was swallowed up by the fish. And the fish basically took him where he, the direction he was supposed to go and spit him out. Now, in a spiritual sense, I don't want God to swallow me up and spit me out. Mm -hmm. I just want to do what it is that he's called me to do. So there is an urgency. There's people, you know, I remember in the beginning when I first got out of prison and people started hearing that I got saved, that I was Christian. And a lot of my fans, people that like my music said, oh man, we feel abandoned by Dino. We feel like he left the Rasa. We felt like he left us. And, I, and, and I'm like, are you kidding me? I said, I think I love you guys more than ever before. You know, I love all people because we're not, so, you know, we don't live according to, to north or south, east or west or skin color, nothing like that. But I will say this, man, is obviously I'm Rasa. So there's a, there, there's a love there because there's a, 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 a relational thing. So if anything, I'm doing the opposite. I'm not ignoring the people and, and the environment I came from. I'm embracing it. If all if I refuse to go on American Cholo or Tony A or you're then maybe somebody might say, man, this dude thinks he's too good or whatever, you know. But no, I I realize something uh, that people will listen to 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 me not because I'm special but because they know I relate to them than some preacher in a three piece suit. And if God has put me in that position, I want to utilize that to the best of my ability because I don't ever want to face God and him say, why did you do that? You know, um, I don't want to do that, man. Yeah, that's cool, man. Totally a blessing, man. It just ministers to me. And uh, yeah, man. And the last question I want to ask you before we go, man, is just um, people are out there. And obviously, you know, there's a lot of people who watch you on YouTube and follow your sermons and follow your daily podcast and you and your wife. Um, but I also want to share, too, if you could tell me for the people out there and there's going to be a lot of, you know, everybody's at work, but there's going to be a lot of people uh, watching this later. What's the importance of church and how do they choose a good church? And for those of you who don't know, Pastor David's church is in Modesto, California. It's called House of Rest. Look it up. You know, I've been there. It's an awesome church. So how do people, you know, what's the importance of going to church and how do they find a good church? Yeah. Um, two things I would say, and there's probably more than two, but the two most important to me is number one, a church that is biblically sound. Um, what I mean by that though, it has to be balanced because there's pastors that, that love the word so much that they use it to lord over over people. There's other pastors that love the people so much that they water the Bible down. So you got to find a strong balance of a church that preaches the Bible the way it's said, but with a compassion for people at the same time, that perfect balance. You know, and um, my second thing is, is biblically speaking, the Bible says that that these signs will follow those who believe. They will cast out demons in my name. They will lay hands on the sick and they shall recover. So, and they will, you know, so for me, um, wherever God is at, he's going to confirm his word. Not only, I'm not talking about just physical healing, because the greatest healing I have ever seen is, is a man's heart change. That is the greatest healing. Because if God heals my elbow, um, and I still go to hell later on, then, what, you know, but if God changes the heart of a man, that is the greatest thing because a changed heart is, is an eternal healing that will last forever. So, so that's my thing is that, that we go to a place where there is true change, true fruit, I guess is what I'm saying. When there's really changed people and, and you got to be able to have discernment, man, because unfortunately in this day and age, there's a lot of people in that fill churches that they talk the talk, but they don't walk the walk. And I've been saying this recently, the last five months, is, is our walk better be a whole lot louder than our talk. 
that's my main thing. So now pastoring for 12 years, if I hear somebody that maybe eight years ago, I would have been impressed because they have a great, great oratory skills and they know how they know scripture and they know how to talk eight years ago. That might've impressed me in my early years of having house of rest. But now, now maturing a little bit more, you know, I mean, I realize when I hear somebody talking eloquently, I want to see, I want to see their life first. I want to talk to their wife and their, and see how their kids are with them. You know, because I tell people all the time, I said, you guys can interview um, my sons and my daughters all day long. If you want, ask them, ask them, Hey, is pastor David the same on Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, you know, even you, brother, you, you've been around me outside of church. You broke bread with me. You, you know what I mean? And I, I, I think that people are sick and tired of religion. People are sick and tired of hypocrites. It's not that people are tired of Jesus. People are tired of the hypocrisy, of the fakeness, of the half-stepping, of the, of, the, of the talk not matching the walk. And I truly believe that people are really, truly searching for somebody that's really living it. So in finding a church, I would say go where people are being changed, where God is moving, and a place that embraces you, where you're not just a number. Because a lot of pastors, too, they, they're hoarders. You know that show Hoarders, where they just fill their house with a whole bunch of stuff? I think I'm one. <laughs> <laughs> you know? And, and it's like people do that with people. And the only, there's only one conclusion to me why a pastor will hoard people is because it builds up his ego to tell other pastors, oh, I got 1,000, I got 10,000, I got 20,000. When in reality, we should be raising up leaders and sending them out. Raising up leaders and sending them out. Raising up leaders, sending them out. Um, I believe that's the Great Commission. You know, um, our, our church has 120 seats. We're about 80% capacity usually on, on most Sundays. And um, I don't, I don't want a bigger church than that. You know, I mean, no, nope. I mean, God's going to do what God's going to do. Don't get me wrong, you know, but I am not purposely seeking to have a mega church. That is not my drive. My drive is to build mega Christians, yeah. you know, and um, I can't stop what God's going to do. But to be honest with you, I, I don't, I don't imagine myself having a giant mega church. I, I don't, I would rather have churches uh, in surrounding cities than just have this church where everybody just comes and drives from an hour away to come, you know? Um, but yeah, I mean, I would just uh, make sure you're in a biblically sound church, first of all. Yeah. So I really encourage you, um, Pastor David's uh, denomination, if you want to call it that for whatever uh, a non-denominational church is Grace International. So I'm sure you could Google, they have a couple of thousand churches. So I'm sure you could Google one close to your area. And, yeah. find it. and I really encourage you get into church because I was saying the other day in a little devotion I did on YouTube that, you know, when you read about Paul, the apostle, when you read about John, the revelator, when you read about all these apostles, they were moving around equipping the saints and preaching the gospel, but they were also involved in communities of believers. They weren't solo Christians. So yeah. I encourage you to get in there. And the Bible says that God gave gifts for the equipping of the saints for the work of the ministry. So you're supposed to be in that body that you could be equipped and to do the work of the ministry. Maybe God will use your life and send you out. So I really encourage you, Grace International, you can look it up. And uh, one yeah. last thing, Pastor David, um, before I give you the last word, um, if you don't mind, there's two people in here ask for prayer. If you mind saying a prayer for them before. Yeah, we we'll do it. Let me, I'll read, I'll read their thing. Um, one was Mondo Vargas. He said he needs prayer. Uh, need prayers strayed. He strayed. Wait, need prayers, brother. Strayed my own, own company or something and need a blessing. A little tough at the moment, but I'm working through it. So he needs prayers. And then um, another one is, let me see if I can find it. Alex Gonzalez says, please pray. I need healing of my mind. I'm thinking about blaspheming all the time, and I have blasphemy thoughts. So if yeah. you could say a prayer, man, for these people and whoever else may be watching, that would be a blessing. Yeah, yeah, of course. Uh, I just want to pray right now for those two men. Um, I pray in the name of Jesus that the Lord show you vision and dream, that he bring you closer to himself. 
that if there is anything clouding your mind, anything demonic that is clouding your mind or coming against you, I speak against it and I cast it out in the name of Jesus. I command every thought that is not of God to shut its mouth in the name of Jesus right now. I pray for revelation. I pray for a new fire. I pray for the Lord to stir something in you like you have never had before in the name of Jesus. I pray for every single person on here that is watching that if you are feeling pain, if you are feeling sick, I command that pain and that sickness to leave right now in the name of Jesus. Right now, I pray for somebody's pancreas in the name of Jesus. I command it to function and work in Jesus' mighty name. I thank you, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen, bro. The power of prayer, man. Jesus said in the Bible, well, wherever two or three are gathered, it's, it's, wherever two or three are gathered, he's in the midst. So he's mm -hmm. here with us. And man, any last words, man, before we go? Um, No, I just want to just, uh, just, you know, I just appreciate every opportunity you give me, brother. Uh, I enjoy your friendship and uh, your blessing to me. Um, and, um, I just want to like I just want to come alongside you and tell people that you can't be a Lone Ranger Christian. Um, we were not meant to be. We're social creatures. Why do you think Why do you think solitary confinement um, is the worst thing you can do to somebody incarcerated? You know, you can take their food away. You can do this. You can do that. But it's it's solitary that 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 destroys you. The reason being is because we're meant to be social. So if we if and and. So in a spiritual sense, many of us put ourselves in isolation, and that is not how it's meant to be. We're supposed to be a family. And um, a lot of times people say, man, I keep going back to the same thing. I keep going back to the same thing. So my question I ask is, are you around different people or are you around the same people? And almost 99% they'll say, oh, I'm still around my old friends. And you can't do that. And a lot of times you think like, okay, if I can't be around my old friends, then I'll just isolate. That is not healthy. If I want to be a good mechanic, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to hang around other mechanics because then eventually I will learn from them. I will glean from them. So in the same way, as Christians, we need to glean off of each other. We need each other. You know, um, there's all, there should always be somebody for me. There's people I look up to and there's people I'm pouring into. Always. You never want to put yourself in a position where you're at the very bottom, you're at the very top. And that is what creates fellowship. Surround yourself with brothers or sisters that that are more mature than you and those that are less mature. And you're going to find a balance there. And that's really important, guys. That's cool. That's a cool illustration uh, above and below spiritually yeah. because you could be, you know, you could be somebody's pulling you up as you're pulling others up. It's constantly pouring into others. And bro, I, I, I lied to you. Cholo Trucker just reminded me right now, if you, if you just take one minute and just share again about the bike ride, because we got new people going on. I'm sorry, bro. You're like, I'm hungry. I got to go. But, you know, yeah. Cholo Trucker just reminded me right now. Well, guys, in case somebody doesn't know, uh, you know, Cholo Trucker, he's crazy. He does boxing matches. He does marathons. He does all kinds of stuff. I saw him swim from Alcatraz to the beach, I was sure that a shark ate him. I was sure that a shark said, look, there's Mexican food, you know, but he came out. And um, so his next challenge was something Sharon and I had before mentioned. Before you go, before you go, before you go on, I want to let yeah. you know that sharks are allergic to Tres Flores. So he was safe. <laughs> go ahead. <laughs> so one day Sharon and I were doing a devotional and we were driving up Highway 1 because this is the thing that, that me and my wife wanted to do, uh, we wanted to have one change of clothes, a debit card, and go down Highway 1 on our bikes all the way to L.A., staying at hotels and just having a great time. So we were sharing that one time on a devotional, and one, and then Chola Trugger calls me. He goes, I know my next challenge. I know my next challenge. I was like, what? He goes, you inspired it. He goes, I want to ride a bike from San Francisco to Santa Monica. And I'm like, bro, how are you going to take our thing? You know what I mean? So... I was like this, man. I said this. I said, if you're going to do it, there's no way you're going to do our bucket list. So that means we're going to do it with you. So we're going to be doing this bike ride. Uh, it's on the website, the exact date, or uh, the church website, House of Rest Church, um, www.houseofrestchurch.com. We're going to go from San Francisco all the way to Santa Monica over six days. And 
here's the thing is that it's open for anybody to join. But I'm telling you right now, if you don't start training now, you're not going to make it, you know. And um, also, let's say you don't you want to do it, but don't want to do all six days. The breakdown of where we're going is on the website on houseofrestchurch.com. We're going from San Francisco to Santa Cruz. I think it's 70 something miles. We're going from Santa Cruz to Big Sur. We're going from Big Sur, you know, so you can do all six days. You can do part of it um, if you want to, but all that information is on the website. All the maps, everything is on there uh, at houseofrestchurch.com. So as a matter of fact, today, um, I helped I helped um, Cholo Trucker locate a, a used bike because he wanted to find a bike. He didn't realize how expensive they are, man. And uh, but I found him a really good bike, and um, and it needed some upgrades. So I told him, you know. So he goes, well, let me let me sell you some money, and you order the parts. You know what I mean? Because he didn't know. So I, he ordered parts. They got delivered here. I went to the um, the bike. Uh, the bike mechanic this morning and i was uh just getting his bike ready and everything so he's going to be getting his bike next week that's sweet man is he driving up or what, what's he gonna do um no my wife is going down there to spend time with her daughter because her daughter's gonna have some surgery so she's gonna help her out and uh and cholo's gonna go and, and pick it up from her over there nice nice yeah by the way big lefty uh that pastor calvary chapel sola i interviewed him in the video somewhere in the video section so yeah and Pastor David, thank you so much for coming on and encouraging everybody And uh, midday. Hopefully you got something you can take and uh, a little nugget for your soul, man. And uh, I just really encourage you all and encourage myself, man. Let's stay close to God and let's stay in his word and let's get involved in a church, man. And, and watch God yeah. use you that you can be planted by the rivers of water. Whatever you do will prosper because you're right there like that green tree, just green because you're, yeah. you're connected to Jesus, the vine. You know, so cool, man. Yeah. Thank you, Pastor David. Uh, we'll let you go. Appreciate you coming on. And thank you, everybody. Please subscribe. We love you guys. Take care. All right. Bye.